Thank you for gathering us again to instruct us. Thank you for your commitment to this fellowship. Thank you, Father, for your commitment to our future, your commitment to your plans for our lives. Every month as we come to this fellowship, you are looking at the future that you have ordained for us. And that is what determines the messages and the instructions that your spirit connects us to. We are grateful. We worship you. It gives us hope and courage that there is a glorious future ahead of us. Thank you, Father. Tonight, again, we open our lives and our destiny to the operations of the Holy Spirit that the truth will make us and the truth will free us. In the name of Jesus, I ask tonight that the instruction that will bring you to the understanding of God's purpose for your life will come out tonight and you will not miss the instruction that is meant for you. Online, on ground, I ask that the word of the Lord will set you on fire Amen. to fulfill your destiny and to pursue it with godly determination. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Everything that is disqualifying us, everything in your life, in your thoughts, in your activity, and in your daily engagement that is disqualifying you for the future that God has ordained, I ask that there will be a revelation of such thing to you tonight by the preaching and the teaching of the truth in the name of Jesus. May you receive the word of God as the word of God tonight. May you receive the tutoring of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Great Holy Spirit, be free in this place. Establish the counsel of the Father and glorify Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you again to this month edition of the Leading Light Fellowship. This is a fellowship of mentoring under the Holy Spirit. Um, it's not just a church service. It's the operation of the Holy Spirit to respond and mentor men and women for the great future that God has for them. It is possible for God to have something for you. It is another thing for you to get yourself ready for what God has for you. Most people are not ready for what God has for them. Many people are not prepared for what God has prepared for them. So it's not enough for you to be aware of the future of glory that is ahead of you. It is also important for you to be prepared for it. Preparation is a greater part of your destiny fulfillment and destiny manifestation. And preparation does not happen in one day. Is that okay? A destiny that is not prepared for is a destiny that is not going to be fulfilled. It's a destiny that is not going to manifest. And I want to pray for you that you will not get to the future before you know how unprepared you are. By that time, it will be a tragedy. Right? A lot of people get to the future only to realize how unprepared they are, how unfit they are for that future. The future of glory is not a function of prayer alone. It's not a function of fasting alone. It's a real function of serious preparation with the truth of the word of God. Because God is going to do what God is going to do. And you must be ready to do what you are supposed to do. It is in preparation like this that you will understand what you are supposed to do. And then you begin to develop the discipline. To play your own role in the destiny that God has for you. Are you hearing me now? So promise of God itself alone cannot fulfill itself. So you must know the preparation. God will make promise, but you must prepare. Okay? And one of the greatest 
uh, move, one of the greatest proof of God's love is that it brings you around an environment that can prepare you. You get what I'm saying now? When God wants to show to you that he loves you and that he is committed to your future, he brings you around an environment that will supply the required preparation. Is that, is that okay? God owes you that duty because it will be unfair for God to be requiring for you to become what he has not given you the privilege of preparation for. So the glory, the future of glory that is ahead of you, okay, that God has designed or that is captured by the promise of God, God is going to do you the good of bringing you around people, around anointed men of God, or around anointed environment that will prepare you for that future. A lot of people are moving to the future unconsciously. But when you are prepared, you are conscious as you move to the future. You are conscious of what you should do, what you should not do, you are conscious of what you go along with you and what should not go along with you. So that by the time you get to that future, you'll be fully fit for what God has planned for you. Is that okay? So that's, that's, the, that's what God is doing with Leading Light Fellowship. Every month, he brings young men and women together and people that believe they have a glorious future to receive instruction that can help them to become everything that God has ordained for them to become. Is that okay? And for, for me, personally, it's very passionate in my spirit to see men and women of the future properly prepared. You get what I'm saying? That is one of the passion that I carry. That is one of the serious aspects of my calling. To see men and women of the future properly prepared. Okay? I have a an anointed hatred for mediocrity, stupidity, and foolishness. I have an anointed, passionate hatred for unseriousness. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Because it's going to bring a waste to your life and a waste to your destiny. And it's going to empower the devil's oppression in your life. The devil is not as powerful as we think. But the devil takes advantage of our foolishness, our ignorance, or our rebellion, or our disobedience to exert his so-called power in our lives. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So I want to pray for you that you will not neglect divine instruction. You will not despise divine preparation. So that anytime you come to leading life fellowship, you come with purpose in your heart. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And receive the word of God and become for yourself what God has ordained for you to become. It is well with you in Jesus' name. You know, for, from last year, when we had our mentoring school in the December, I think, we started looking at a very important subject, and that is enhancing the accuracy of your destiny decision. I believe the quality of the decisions you are taking will determine the future you are moving to. I believe that that your decisions are your drivers to the future. If your decisions about everything today is right, the future is guaranteed. But if the decision today is wrong, by whatever reason, the future is not guaranteed. So beyond, beyond prayers, beyond fasting and all that, we must be practically taking decisions that are, one, in alignment with the will of God for our lives. Two, that are future-oriented. That we see to the manifestation of the future. Don't take a decision today that will cancel the future. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And then I also remember we have started this one. That will cross-check our decision with authority figures in our lives. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So when we started, I gave you what an authority figure is, who an authority figure is, a general overview. Because 
you cannot fulfill destiny in isolation. You cannot on your own. You don't have everything it takes on your own to fulfill your destiny. Are you getting what I'm saying now? You can't say I'm self-sufficient. I have everything I need. I, I, I have all the qualities I need to fulfill my destiny. Nobody can say that. Nobody can say that. There are people that has gone ahead of you that God has prepared to supply you with the wisdom that you will need on your way. So your ability to identify such people and come under the influence of an anointed authority figure is going to help you a lot. A lot of people are wasting away in different places because they don't believe that they, should, they need an authority figure that can supervise their destiny evolution under God. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? But it's increasingly clear from the Bible and with contemporary experiences that you cannot alone by yourself fulfill your destiny. You will need to fully submit to a God-ordained, anointed authority figure. We have too many people in the world that want to stand in the position of authority in your life. When somebody is desiring to stand in the position of authority in your life, the fact that they desire to stand in that position shows you that they are not qualified. Are you hearing me now? Because anybody who desires, who desires, who, who feels it's a matter of status for him to be in a position of authority in your life, is looking for to manipulate you. Authentic authority figures are known by the grace they carry. Are you hearing me now? The grace, you know what you need. And you know when you see what you need. So there is somebody carrying the grace that you need for you. Are you hearing me now? That has the life, that has the capacity in the spirit, that has the discipline, the consistency, the focus to provoke respect naturally from you. Are you getting what I'm saying now? That person is an authority figure in your life. Okay? What you become does not scare that person. Right? Even if you become the greatest millionaire or billionaire in the world, he's still going to look at you in the face and tell you the truth when you are wrong. That is where your safety lies. So it's not a matter of status. Or a matter of somebody just want people to see him as a father. No. Being an authority figure is a divine responsibility. And people are graced for it. Did you get what I'm saying now? So don't deceive yourself and don't allow anybody to deceive you. You get what I'm saying now? When you see an authority figure, you will know. He doesn't struggle to rule you or to control you. But you are the one that will submit willingly to the grace that he carries. Because you know that he carries the grace that can take you safely to your future. Are you hearing me now? And when you are hearing words and instruction, you must ask yourself, are these words true? Are these instructions genuine? Either The issue is not either you like it or not. You may not even like it. But you must convince yourself that ah, this thing is true. Even if I don't like it, it is true. Are you hearing me now? And once it is true, you better know you are in the presence of an authority figure. And open your life and receive tutelage and instruction so that you can get to where God is taking you to. It is well with you. You got all that. So we began to look at the need for authority figures in your life. Why are authority figures needed? We are still on that. When I started, I outlined about seven need for authority figure. We have done three. We are going to do number four today. Is that okay? Uh, number one is that authority figure helps in the early discovery and development of personal, moral, and spiritual qualities. Number two, is that authority figure facilitate the early discovery of personal strength and how to accurately deploy them. Number three, authority figure facilitate early exposure of personal weaknesses 
and how to overcome them. How many of you remember this was what we did last month? Okay. And then there are different events around us and in the country that has validated that truth. Is that okay? I won't be particular about any. But if you are observant in different circles in our country in recent time, you will agree with me that personal weakness has a way of destroying your future. Is that okay? And it is important for you to submit to the influence and authority of an authority figure because one of the need for authority figure is that it will point your attention to the area of weakness in your life. There are weaknesses that you don't even know they are weaknesses. But an authority figure knows those weaknesses when he sees one. And he knows the potential damage and the colossal loss that that weakness can bring into your life and future. So an authority figure does not think about how you feel today. It's going to show you those weaknesses, not only show you, bring you under a discipline process to overcome those weaknesses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now? So, we dealt with that last month. So, today, I'm focusing on the fourth need of an authority figure. And write this down. An authority figure brings your life under godly control, responsibility, and accountability. An authority figure in your life brings your life under godly control, responsibility, and accountability. So anybody who is trying to function in your life without the motive of bringing your life under godly control, responsibility, and accountability is not an authority figure in your life. He may be older than you, may be richer than you. But when his influence in your life is not to bring your life under godly control, responsibility, and accountability, that person is not an authority figure. Is that okay? Praise God. There are people in your life that you must identify and submit to their influence that you know that naturally they carry the grace to bring your life under godly control, under responsibility and accountability. You don't have to like their face. You don't have to like their style. But you must love their substance. Did you hear what I just said? You don't have to like their face. You don't have to like their style. You don't even have to like the way they talk. But you must love the substance they are bringing into your life. Because one of the problems that people have is I don't like the face of that man. I don't like the way that man talk. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like. It's not about what you like or what you don't like. It's about what is he bringing into your life. Is he what you need? You must get to a place in your life that you refuse to deceive yourself. A lot of people are deceiving themselves. You must not pamper yourself. Because once you pamper yourself today, you are going to damage your future tomorrow. So you must know an authority figure is bringing something into your life. Your business is not his face. Your business is not his style. Your business is not what he says or how he talks. That's not your business. Your business is this. What is this bringing into my life? What is he bringing to my life? Is somebody hearing me now? What is he bringing into my life? So an authority figure brings your life under con godly control. I want you to underline the word godly. God, because control can be human control. Control can be demonic control. But we're talking of godly control brings your life under godly control, under responsibility, and under accountability. That's why you need an authority figure in your life. Praise God. And uh, what I want to do is to 
uh, look at that. I want you to first of all take note that there are three, these are three spiritual forces that an authority figure brings into your life or brings your life under. Number one, godly control is a spiritual force that an authority figure brings your life under. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Number two, responsibility. Responsibility is a spiritual force that an authority figure brings your life under. You notice that when you begin to submit to an authority figure in your life, you begin to come under a divine force of responsibility. If you follow correctly, for the first time you begin to realize that you are becoming responsible. Because it is when you have godly control that you can make decisions of destiny that will be qualitative. Did you get that now? It is when you are under responsibility that you are going to be able to make qualitative decisions of destiny. It is when you are under accountability that you will be able to make qualitative decisions of destiny. A person that is not under godly control a person that is not under, that is irresponsible and that is unaccountable cannot make qualitative decisions. Decisions that are qualitative is not what you just make anyhow, irrespective of your positioning. No. You must be in a position of godly control, responsibility, and accountability. I have seen a lot of people that are irresponsible, that are not under any control, that believes they can do whatever they like because they are the owner of their life. Okay, and I've seen people that are unaccountable to anybody. And I've watched over the years the decisions of those people, they are never qualitative. Are you hearing me now? Because they are not in a frame of mind to make qualitative decision that can guarantee their future. Did you get what I'm saying now? So it's very important you know that. So the three spiritual forces of godly control, of responsibility and accountability brought into your life by the presence of an anointed and God-ordained authority figure always determine the quality of your decisions of destiny. Is that okay? Always determine the quality of your decision of destiny. So when you submit to an authority figure and it brings your life under these three forces of godly control, of responsibility and of accountability. As a young man, a young woman, you are under godly control. As an old fellow, you are under godly control. You are under the spirit of responsibility and the spirit of accountability. It will always determine the quality of your decisions of destiny. Is that okay? Praise God. That's something I want you to take note. How do you know a decision is qualitative? Did you hear what I just said now? How do you know a decision is qualitative? That is something I call gas. Somebody say gas. Say it again now. Say gas. Okay, I said gas because I wanted you to be able to remember. G-A-S. A decision that is qualitative, number one, is godly. 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 Okay? Number two is accurate. Accurate. And number three is strategic. Don't forget it. Anytime you make it, we have decisions that are accurate and strategic but that are not godly. That's not a qualitative decision of destiny. So the three qualities of a qualitative decision of destiny is one, it is what? Godly. Number two, it is what? Accurate. And number three, it is what? Strategic. You get what I'm saying now? That's what you should be looking for. 
It must be godly. It may be a decision about your career. Maybe a decision about your relationship. Maybe a decision about your marriage. Maybe a decision about your business. Maybe a decision about anything that has to do with your life and future. If it is going to be qualitative, if you are not going to regret it tomorrow, it must be one, godly. It must be accurate. It must be strategic. Are you getting what I'm saying now? But what I'm saying is this. For you to be able to make godly, accurate, and strategic decisions of destiny, you must come under the force of godly control, responsibility, and accountability. Did you get that now? Praise God. Anybody who is not submitted anywhere is not in a frame of mind or in a spiritual position to make qualitative decisions of destiny. And that is what an authority figure brings into your life. And that's why you need an authority figure. Is that okay? So, I've mentioned three forces. So, what I'm going to do tonight is to take them one by one. Right? Number one now. Let's look at godly control. Godly control. That is the first spiritual force that an authority figure brings into your life. And that's why you need an authority figure in your life. Godly control. And if you have an authority figure in your life, watch out. This is what is going to be bringing into your life. Godly control. Is that okay? The presence and influence of an authority figure in your life compel you to live a responsible life within the safety limit of godly boundaries. When you have an authority figure in your life, it has an influence and a presence that compel you to live a responsible life within the safety limit of godly boundaries. You cannot be under the influence of an authority figure and you are truly following and you will not live a responsible life within the safety limit of godly boundaries. You get what I'm saying now? You will live is it, that the presence and the influence of an authority figure in your life compel you to live a responsible life within the safety limit of godly boundaries. You will always know your boundaries. You will always know how is the limit of your safety in your character, in your conduct, and in your life. That's what an authority figure brings into your life. And that's why your life can never be like the life of other people who are not under any influence of an authority figure. Who believes they can do what they can do. Okay? I discovered that nobody is safe in life until there is a consciousness of godly limit and boundaries. Nobody is safe in life until there is a consciousness of godly limit and boundaries. I want you to take note of that statement. Nobody is safe in life until there is a consciousness of godly limits and boundaries. Your safety is not a function of where you live most of the time. Your safety is not a function of <clears throat> the house you are staying in. Your safety in life is a function of the consciousness of godly limit and boundaries. If you are going to be safe in life, you must have a consciousness of godly limit and godly boundaries. If you are going to be safe in any relationship, you must have a consciousness of godly limits and godly boundaries. How far can I go? How far am I permitted to go? But if you don't know 
if you don't have a consciousness of godly limits and godly boundaries, and you believe you can do anything you like at any time you like, you are, you are compromising your safety. Are you hearing me now? Don't fall for the deception of I am the owner of my life. I can do what I like. That deception compromises your personal safety. Even the president of a nation that is not fully working with the consciousness of limits and boundaries is not safe. Are you with me now? It's not safe. With all the soldiers and all the military personnel that are monitoring him, if he doesn't have a consciousness of safe, I mean, of limit and boundary, how far can I go? How much can I do? How much can I say? How much can I drink? How much can I eat that will be safe for me? You must be able to recognize your boundary in anything you are doing. Are you hearing me now? Have you heard of Yorubas when they say that when somebody gets, when somebody enters a city and he is not disgraced, he knows his limit. How many of you have heard of that word before? Eh? Awolumate, iwanare, lo shekini. Cho ba mo wanare, nko kilo manche, o ma tenye, olo o nije kote. Bo wa mo wanare. Is somebody hearing me now? So if you don't understand limit and boundary, you will be out of control. So you are not going to be safe. Nobody is safe in life without the consciousness of godly limits and boundaries. As a pastor now, as a pastor, and I have members in the church looking up to me and the grace of God upon my life, I must be able to understand my limits and my boundaries so that I can be safe. Is somebody hearing me now? Now if you are working in the bank and you assume that all the money you are counting is your money and that you can dip your hand anytime into that money that you are counting, just because you are a cashier in the bank, you should be ready to go to jail Yes or no? That you are counting millions every day doesn't mean that that million is your own. You must know the limit of counting and spending. <laughs> Praise, God. Praise God. Somebody say limit. Somebody say boundary. Now, people are in danger today because they don't understand the godly limits around their life. Samson died before his time because he doesn't understand the godly limits in his life. There are godly limits in everything you do. In eating, in drinking, in relationship, in talking, in thinking, in looking at things that are... You must walk with a consciousness of limits and boundaries and make sure you don't go beyond that. That's what an authority figure brings you into. When your pastor chooses to be friendly, you must not be stupid. Did you hear that? When a pastor chooses to be friendly, you must not be stupid. He's not your friend. He's your father. He can be friendly, but he's not your friend. You remind yourself, he's not my friend though, but he can be friendly. He can be very friendly. We have pastors that are very friendly. But you must know your limit so that you don't overbound your limit and get on the wrong side of the anointing. And then you don't get into the danger of familiarity. Because once that happens, you are not going to receive anything again. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Praise God. You must know people in your life, know situations in your life, know relationships in your life, and understand your limits and your boundaries. Amen. So, no, but that is, you know why? Because that is what determines how safe you are. Okay? The freedom, you know, look at me. Freedom in quote. Freedom. Somebody say freedom. 
eh, I want you to do as I'm doing. Freedom. Freedom in quote. When they say freedom, you know, we're talking about the so-called freedom. Did you get that? Now? So the freedom that makes a person believe he or she can do anything at any time to any extent without a sense of caution and limitation is dangerous and destructive. That so-called freedom that makes somebody to think that he can do anything he or she likes at any time without any caution and limitation is dangerous and destructive. Tell somebody, be under godly caution. Say it again, stay under godly control. That's when you are safe. Until you know your safe and godly limits in life. You will become irresponsible, careless, and irredeemably lawless. Until you know your safe and godly limits in life. And when I say in life, I mean in everything you do, in every situation, in every relationship, you must know your safe and godly limit. Because if you don't know your godly limit, you will become irresponsible, you will become careless, you will become irredeemably lawless. I have seen lawless people today. And the implication is that, one, they can never make any qualitative decision. And number two, the future is cancelled for them. Is that okay? Praise God. So you must know your limit. Let me give an example. In the consumption of sugar, for example, I'm just using that as an example. You must be able to apply this example to any other thing in your life. In the consumption of sugar or sweet things, how many of you believe that you should know your limit, your safe limit? How many of you believe that? That somebody is eating sugar like water every day doesn't mean that you should do the same thing. Somebody's limit is different from your own limit. But as an individual, that carry an individual destiny that is going to a peculiar future. In everything in life, you must know your safety limit. Because if you don't know your safety limit, you will become irresponsible, you will become careless, you will become irredeemably lawless. So I use that sugar now to give you an understanding of what I'm talking about. Apply the same thing to finance. Apply the same thing to relationship. Apply the same thing to friendship. Apply the same to everything in your life. You must know your safe limit and create that boundary for yourself. I must not go over this boundary. Did you get that now? I must not go over this boundary. This is my boundary of legitimacy. And stick with it. That is what an authority figure brings you under. It is what we call a spiritual force of godly control. I get what I'm saying now. In marriage now, no matter how much your wife provoke you, you know as a man you must not one verbally abuse your wife two, you must not lift your hands to beat her are you hearing what I'm saying now? praise God <laughs> praise God if you don't know that limit you will become a beast very soon are you getting what I'm saying now? as a man you relate with women and all that Maybe by virtue of your position and roles in life, there are different kinds of women around you and all that. You must know which one can I touch and which one must I never touch. And the one I must not touch, 
what is my limit as a man? Because if you don't understand the limit, the righteous limit, the safe limit, you will soon become irresponsible. You will become careless. You will become irredeemably lawless. And when that happens, you can never be in a state of mind to make qualitative decision. And when you cannot make qualitative decision, the future is already compromised. When you are alone and you are watching things, you must know the limit of safety for what, what you are watching. What can I watch? What can I not watch? If you need supervision every time for what is lawful for you to watch, you are irresponsible. And it is an indiscipline. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Must be able to know, okay, this I can watch. This one I cannot watch. And you set your limits. And keep to it. That's when you are going somewhere. That's what we call godly control. That is what an authority figure brings into your life. By word, by instruction, by influence, by his presence. That's what it, by training, that's what it brings into your life. So no matter the status we are reached in life, we must bring ourselves under godly what? Control. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Because you will get to it. L listen to me. The more you go up in life, the fewer the number of people that can speak into your life. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Are you hearing me? Do you get what I'm saying now? The higher you go in life, the fewer the number of people that can speak into your life. Look at these big, big people. Maybe politicians, professors, leaders, big men that has money and all that, that are top in their different areas of life. You know that not many people have the courage to speak into their life. Yes or no? Even if they know that what they are doing is wrong, you will see people either for fear or for selfish gain. They will keep quiet. Have you heard when they say, is it in your mouth that they will hear that the mother of, king, of the king is a witch? Have you heard of that statement before? Is it in your mouth that they will hear that the mother of the king is a witch? Even if they know that the mother of the king is a witch, will people say it? They keep quiet. Because they are talking about the mother of the king. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? So as you keep growing up, because I know you are going to succeed in life, that I know, as you keep going up, going up, going up, going up, the number of people that can speak into your life will reduce. Not even your friends will be able to speak into your life at a level of manifestation. Some will not be able to speak into your life because they don't have the capacity and the courage and they may not have what it takes to bring you wisdom and instruction. So people that can speak into your life will be reducing and reducing. But you must bring your life under godly control. And you must know the few authority figures in your life that what you are becoming is not going to scare them. That's what they bring into your life. Godly control. Are you hearing me now? If Bode becomes president of the country tomorrow, stand up Bode. If he becomes president of the country tomorrow, are you hearing me now? To every other person, he is the president of the country. To me, he is Bode. I know Bode. Did you hear what I'm saying now? He is Bode, so I can call him Bode. You are wrong. Sit down. Let me talk to you. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. So, that's what an authority of God brings into your life. Godly control. So, you must understand your limits now. What I can do and what can I, I cannot do. Now that you are not the president, so that by the time you become president, it's part of your life. Otherwise, you become irresponsible, you become careless, and you become lawless. Are you hearing me now? Don't allow God lack of control to bring to jeopardize your future. See that? Is that okay? Praise God. So, what I want to do now under godly control. I want you to write down
practical implications of living under godly control. Practical implication of living under godly control. You know why I'm stating this practical implication? Because to many people, everything I'm saying now, it looks like grammar. <laughs> they can't handle it. Not to talk of practicing it. I want to give you smaller, smaller points now that it's no longer a grammar to you. It's a reality that you can go home with. Did you get what I'm saying now? Praise God. Because if I teach and you don't get anything, then it, it, the whole thing is wasted. So let's come practical now. I don't believe in theory. You can teach me theory. If I cannot practice it in my daily life, then it's wasted. Hello? I don't believe in theory. For God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe will not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, yes. How does that scripture apply to my life today? That is what I'm going to handle and program into my life. Is that okay? So, what, is, what are the practical implications of living under godly control. When you say this one is living under godly control, what is the practical implication? Number one, knowing the difference and the boundaries between what you can do and what you cannot do. Knowing the difference and the boundary between what you can do and what you cannot do. That's number one. So to say that to, to be under godly control, the first practical implication is this. You must know the difference between what you can do and what you cannot do. Hello, somebody. Is that clear enough? Good. Every that is going to have a future must know the difference between what you can do and what you cannot do. That is what an authority figure brings into your life. That is godly control. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Complete the statement. Hence, you are not frivolous, carefree, or lawless. Hence, you are not frivolous, carefree, or lawless. Hence, you are not frivolous, carefree, or lawless. As you go, one of the reasons why you need godly control and why you need uh, anointed authority figure is that it brings a force of godly control into your life. And when are you under godly control? When you know the difference between and the boundary between what you can do and what you cannot do. That's when you are under godly control. Is that okay? Praise God. And now look up. I'm talking now. Assuming I ask somebody to stand up. Probably in a church situation or whatever. And I'm talking to that person. And that person is responding angrily to me. You know that person is not under godly control. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. Because he doesn't know the difference between what he can do and what he cannot do. Beloved, always know the difference between what you can do and what you cannot do. Know the difference between what you can say and what you cannot say. Know the difference between what you can eat and what you cannot eat. That is when you are under godly control. That is a practical implication of living under godly control. It's not everything you know that you can say. I talked to a lady one time. She said, ah, excuse me, sir. Ah, there is nobody I cannot talk to. That's a person that has no future. There are some people you should never talk. You should never talk rudely to. Is that okay? Did you get what I'm saying now? 
There are people that you should never talk rudely to. Even when a dog is mad, he can know his owner when his owner is present. Always talk to yourself. Don't be somebody that can, I can do anything, I can talk anything, I can, ah. No. No. The difference and the boundary between what you can do and what you cannot do. As a pastor in this church, and by the grace of God, general overseer of this mission, I must not allow that position to get into my head. There is difference and boundary of what I can do and what I cannot do. Being a general overseer doesn't mean I can do everything. Did you hear that? Even God Almighty knows what he can do and what he cannot do. Somebody said, but the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. But God cannot sin. What about that? What about that? Cannot. Praise God. When people have money, they believe they can do everything. When people have power, position, they believe they can do everything. Don't wait until life tells you that there are things you should not do. By that time, it may be very destructive. Is that okay? So the first practical implication of living under godly control is that knowing the difference and the boundaries between what you can do and what you cannot do. Number two, the second practical implication of living under godly control is living life with a sense of godly caution and reasonable restraint. Living life with a sense of godly caution and reasonable restraint. Living life with a sense of godly caution and reasonable restraint. Reasonable restraint. Somebody say reasonable restraint. Did you get that now? Godly caution. Somebody say caution. Somebody say, How many of you know that one of the most important parts of a vehicle is the brake? Huh? Is the brake. If a vehicle is brand new, fresh from the factory, and they gave it to you to drive it to Lagos, Tiaroba, and they told you, but there is one but, it doesn't have a brake. Will you drive that car? Why? Why? Because if you are, if you are going on a speed of 100, 120, 180, and you need to stop, there is nothing that is going to caution that vehicle. He may as well drive you to hell, to glory. <laughs> Did you get what I'm saying now? Someone is a godly caution. Say reasonable restraint. That sometimes you are talking, you are talking, it's not everything you will let out. That's reasonable restraint. Reasonable restraint. You must know. Mm, mm, mm. They say, what about the other one? Forget about the other one. Until another time. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you now. But you can't receive it now. So, he, 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 he received it. It's not everybody you are talking to that you pour. Or he said, well, I don't have anything in my mind. I open all my mind to everybody. You are a foolish person. You won't last up. It's not everybody that is worthy of your secret. There are some people that a single secret they know about you, they will use it against you. So you say, I'm a very plain man. I'm a very plain man. In fact, I have no secret. I, anybody, I tell anybody everything about me. That is foolishness. Somebody say godly caution. Say reasonable restraint. That is what we mean by godly control. Living life with a sense of godly caution and reasonable restraint. Complete the statement. Hence, you are not loosed or dangerously exposed. Hence, you are not loosed 
or dangerously exposed and you are simply under godly control. Hence, you are not loosed or dangerously exposed, but you are simply under godly control. Is that okay? Number three, the third practical implication of living under godly control is knowing what binds you and what is binding on you. Knowing what binds you and what is binding on you. That's godly control. Knowing what binds you and what is binding on you. People that are going to the future must know what binds them and what is binding on them. Is that okay? That is where you'll be able to manage freedom with maturity. You know what binds you and you know what is binding on you. As you move to the future, as you go up in God's purpose for your life, you must know that. That is what it practically means to be under godly control. That's the first, that's the first force that an authority figure brings into your life. How many of you know that your words bind you? And your words are binding on you. How many of you know? Look up. When you say, I am finished. It's not what somebody has told, said to you. It's what you willingly by yourself for whatever reason at all open your mouth and you say ah, I am finished. How many of you know that that word is binding on you? Even in the spirit. So when you're under godly control you must know what binds you and what is binding on you. Are you getting what I'm saying now? How many of you know that your promise binds you and it is also binding on you? Your promise. When you are fond of making promise and you are not fulfilling the promise, you will soon become a man that lacks integrity. And very soon, people will never take you serious. And very soon, your future is progressively being eroded. Because when people lose confidence in you, you will become an unsellable commodity in the market of life. And everybody will say, don't mind that man, just open his mouth, forget about him more. If it tells you it's coming back, you better be going. Have you seen people like that before? Their value is beginning to reduce. Their estimation is being, is being contaminated. So it doesn't matter the, the glory, the anointing they carry, the destiny they carry. They are becoming more useless and irrelevant. Because they don't know what binds them and what is binding on them. If I say I'm coming, if I would not be able to come, I should be able to send another message. Ah, I thought I would be able to come before, but please permit me, I won't be able to come. Why am I apologizing? Because my promises binds me, and it is what? Binding on me. Did you get that? How many of you know that the word of God is binds you? And it is binding on you. How many of you know that your roles in life binds you and it is binding on you? Let me give an example. As a father, I have children. Do you know the role of being a father binds me and it is binding on me? Yes or no? Did you get what I'm saying now? Do you know the role of being a husband binds me and it is binding on me? Wearing married ring is not for fun. It is a reminder of what binds me and what is what binding on me. 
Did you hear that now? But you know that people don't know today. They wear marriage ring, <laughs> wedding ring, and they still commit adultery. <laughs> and they have girlfriend all around town, and they are wearing wedding ring. So to them, it's just a fashion. They don't understand the covenant nature of that ring. You get what I'm saying now? So God, somebody say godly control. Say it again, godly control. So the practical implication of living your life under godly control is that you know what binds you and what is binding on you. Do you agree with me that being a son or a daughter, either physically, biologically, spiritually, binds you and it is what binding on you? Do you know? Do you know that being a wife is binds you and it is what? Binding on you. Praise God. Have you, have you remembered during wedding service, the pastor said, you forsake all other men and stay with this one alone. Huh? Good. That's anointed jail. <laughs> and don't ever attempt prison break. Otherwise, you'll be arrested <laughs> by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Praise, God. Praise God. A lot of married men today want to do prison break. <laughs> I didn't know this is going to be so I'm tired. What? Tired of what? The words you said in the presence of God and his people binds you and his what? Binding on you. Did you get what I'm saying now? Praise God. Number four. Number four. Number four practical implication of living under godly control is exercising the power of your free will within godly boundaries and in a manner that gives glory to God. Exercising the power of your free will. Within godly boundaries and in a manner that gives glory to God. Exercising the, what does it say? Exercising the power of your free will. Within godly boundaries and in a manner that what? That gives glory to God. How many of you believe that you are a free moral agent? How many of you have heard that statement before? I'm a free moral agent. How many of you have heard that statement before? Oh yes, you are a free moral agent. Because when God made man, he gave man a free will to do whatever he likes to do. How many of you know God is not going to tamper with your free will? Talk to me. You know why? God gave you that ability. You are not a goat. You are not a cow. You are not, that's one of the areas you are different from an animal. An animal does not have free will. Human being, God gave us free will. If you choose to go to hell, God will respect that decision. Did you hear? If you choose to go to hell, God will respect that decision. If you choose to die untimely, God will respect that decision. He won't stop it. Because that's your choice. Have you heard when Jesus told Mary, no, told Martha, when Martha came and told Jesus, I said, tell Mary to come and help me, uh uh. And Jesus said, why are you careful for many things? Mary has chosen that good part and not, nobody can take it away from her. If it is the evil part too that Mary chose, do you also agree with me that nobody can take it away from her? I've seen people that come to a good church but they choose to be bad people. It doesn't mean that the pastor is not anointed. That's their choice. When Jesus was a pastor physically, Judas chose to go to hell. And Jesus respected that decision. You will agree with me that 
under normal condition, under the anointed pastorship of Jesus, nobody should go to hell. But Judas committed suicide. And he went to hell. That's his choice. Another person was chosen to replace his own portion. And life and God's purpose move on. God will allow you to make your choice. But you will never be free from the consequence of your choice. You alone will carry that consequence. So when you hear people say, it's my life, I can do whatever, no problem, go ahead. But listen to me. When we say godly control, it means exercise sin. Do you understand that point now? The power of your free will within what? Godly boundaries and in a manner that gives glory to God. That is godly control. Yes, I can do anything I like because I'm a free moral agent. But when I'm under godly control, I exercise that power of my free will within godly boundaries and in a manner that will give glory to God. I can do everything, but I will not do everything that will not give glory to God. Anything that is going to give glory to God, I'm not going to do it. Did you get that now? Praise God. I'm, I can eat anything. After all, it's my mouth. But I'm not going, but if I, if I, if I smoking now, assuming I'm here now, I teach you a little bit, I go somewhere and then smoke. I even send some of you to go and get me the cigarette and I smoke. And I come and talk about godly control. Something is wrong somewhere. I'm going, to, I'm going to confuse you because you don't know which one to believe. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> because you know, I can smoke, but does it bring glory to God? I can take beer. We have pastors that are taking beer. Yes or no? And they are reverend, very reverend in particular. <laughs> but they take beer. But does it bring glory to God? No. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. Exercise the power of your will within the godly boundaries and the manner that gives glory to God. Number five. The practical implication of living under godly control. Having full awareness of the things that are lawful and permissible. Having full awareness of the things that are lawful and permissible. And clearly differentiating them from things that are not expedient. Having full awareness of things that are lawful and permissible. And clearly differentiating them from things that are not expedient. Somebody say things that are not expedient. So you must know things that are lawful and that are permissible. And differentiate them from things that are not expedient. Now, I want somebody to give me... First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. One of the statements that Paul made there. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. Yes. First of all, read it for me in KJV. Now listen. Yes. Okay. Can we thank you, man? Can we read it together on the screen? Okay. All things are what are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Hello. Hello. 
when a man and a and a man, when a man and a man decide to get married, we are in that time of the world that they believe that everybody must respect the fundamental human right of people. You can choose to be married to a woman. Another man chooses to be married to his fellow man. So for you to say it is wrong, you are, you are, you are, you are violating his fundamental human right. We have gotten to that level now. In Western world, that is their thinking. In fact, they, 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 they are even planning to send pastors who refuse to join gay couple in church to jail. The gay couple, will report, they will go and report. And then they will charge the pastor for infringing on their personal rights. They say you don't have tolerance for human diversity. <laughs> English will kill this world. <laughs> they say you don't have tolerance for human diversity. Somebody, do you know in the Western world, somebody can decide to, to marry a monkey. And they will do a very lavish, elaborate wedding. And he will buy suit for a monkey. I'm telling you. And if you look at him, anyhow, he's going to sue you. Do you know in Western countries now, Women can go stark naked and is walking in the, in the town. And if you look at her anyhow, or you look at her despisefully, she tells you you are abusing her. You are abusing her. It's a facial abuse. She should charge you to court that you are looking down on her. And they will tell you that you have no tolerance for diversity. The official law of nation permits people to be crazy and mad. I'm telling you. And we have the devil's advocate in lawyers that will defend them. All this transgender, all that lesbianism, gay and all that, they are gathering now. In fact, Western countries are beginning to say that any nation that does not respect the right of gay, lesbian, transgender, and all that, they will begin to sanction them. And they will begin to withdraw aid, financial aid. Are you hearing me now? Are you hearing me now? And very soon, most countries will not be able to stand without such aid. So they are going to give him. Are you hearing me? So you must know what is lawful. So look at this. All things are lawful. <laughs> if you decide to go and marry a man and you are a man, you go and marry a man and you man, it's lawful. Laws of your country can protect you. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But I must not be brought under the power of any. Now, look up. I went to look at the dictionary meaning of that word expedient, and I discovered that something can be expedient. Expedient means it's something that is good to be done under that condition and situation, but it may carry with it the consequence of a moral body. Are you hearing me now? So when they say that is politically expedient, are you hearing me now? It doesn't mean that it is morally correct. Hello, somebody. Hello. Good. When they say that thing is politically expedient, doesn't mean that it is morally correct or that it is right in the sight of God. But politically, it is expedient. Let me give an example. Maybe you have... Uh, an old woman that is about 120 and that is already dying. But yet, because they have done some things, 
when she was young, demonic insurance. And she refused to actually let out the ghost. But her body is already decaying. I know of someone that when they drop water in her mouth, it comes out of her anus. Immediately they drop it in her mouth. It comes out like that. What is the meaning of that? Hello? She's so old, about 130 now. When you put water in her mouth, it goes out in her anus immediately. What does that tell you? That the whole system has collapsed. In fact, when you put water in her mouth, you will be hearing like as if trailer is moving on the highway. That is to tell you that nothing is working again. And recently they discovered that, uh, you know, worms are coming out of her private parts. And her body is peeling away. The flesh is giving way. And she herself is telling her children that they, they did not open the door for me. They did not open the door for me. Tell them to open the door. That's for those of you who want to become 160 year old before you die. <laughs> Praise God. So they discovered that, that the, the, her parent has had seven children before she was born. And each of those child die, 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 die. So they have what they call a biku in Yoruba balance. So when they now have her now, because they didn't want to lose her, they did some demonic insurance. So her body is dead. Everything is dead. But she has not. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. And somebody is telling, somebody is telling one of the children that inject her and let her die. Now some people may believe that that is expedient. But you will carry the moral burden of being the one that killed your mother. And it's going to be a moral burden on your conscience forever. And of course, you know that is not right in the sight of God. You are guilty of murder. Are you hearing me now? So somebody asked me yesterday, he said, sir, what are we going to do? Because I'm not telling you a story. I'm telling you of what is currently a challenge, currently. He said, what are, what are we going to do, sir? I said, there's no problem. Does she have a pastor? Correct pastor that she... Respect and all that. He said, yes. Okay. I said, call the pastor to come and lay hands on her and say, Father, we release your daughter. Release your daughter. Jesus said, anything we ask in the, from the Father in his name, he will give. So, Father, kindly release your daughter from this burden. Release her. Anoint her and release her. As it doesn't matter the demonic insurance. The power of the name of Jesus will release her. The Bible said the anointing break yoke, including demonic yoke. That is better. He said, wow, I have never thought of that before. So of course, we can release. We can pray for somebody to come back from life. We can pray for somebody to be released. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Did you get what I'm saying now? So, you must know all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. You must know, no, you can do anything, but this thing I want to do, is it profitable? That is what it means to be under godly control. Did you get that now? Praise God. Number six, knowing the difference between what is lawful and good and what can edify. Knowing the difference between what is lawful and good and what can edify. Now, let me read 1 Corinthians 6 12 for you in this version of the Bible. You know, I'm still talking about that number five. I just want to read this version of the Bible to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Are you there? Okay. Let me quickly read this to you. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. 
I can do anything I want to. If Christ has not said no. But some of these things aren't good for me. Even if I'm allowed to do them. I will refuse to. If I think they might get such a grip on me. That I can't easily stop when I want to. Did you get that now? So that something is lawful and permissible doesn't mean that it is something you should do. You should find out how profitable is that thing is. So number six, knowing the difference between what is lawful and good and what can it defy. Beloved, it is not everything that is lawful and good can edify. So if you are going to be under godly control, you must know the difference between what is lawful and good and what can edify. What are the things that can edify? That should be your basic consideration. Not just that it is lawful and good. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? There are some people that live their life in a manner that other people will offend other people will will offend spiritually don't live your life in a way that will make other people to offend spiritually it may be good for you lawful for you but does he edify other people hello does he edify other people Does he edify other people? So when you are thinking of what to do, this thing is lawful, this thing is good, I must also be thinking, does he help other people to grow? Does he help other people to love God? Does he help other people to become more like Christ? So it's not just about you. It's about other people too that you have an influence over their life. So having, living a life under godly control means knowing the difference between what is lawful and good and what can edify. I want you to give me 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 23. First Corinthians ten twenty three. Are we there? Okay. Can I have it on the screen, please? First Corinthians ten twenty three. I want everybody to look at this scripture. Okay. Is this King James version? I want King James version. Okay. Okay. Can we read together? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Are you hearing me now? Look up everybody. As a lady, you can use a ring that is bigger than your head. You know some people use it today. Earring that is bigger than their head. And then you hang one here and you hang another one here. In the name of fashion. Of course, there is no place in the Bible that the Bible says you should not use earring. Somebody say, Pastor, you are wrong. Uh -uh. What of where the Bible says that people should not care, people should not let their adornment be outward adornment. Eh? What about that? Now, if you read Bible very well, you know that the Bible says that it's talking to Christian women, daughters of Zion, that don't let your adornment be just physical adornment of plating of air, wearing of apparel, and using jewelries. So if you mean that that place mean that people should not use jewelry, then it will mean that people should not wear clothes. 
Hello? Because if what that place means is that they should not use jewelry at all. You should also remember that it's not only jewelry that is talking about there. It talks about wearing of apparel. Yes or no? Plating of air and using of jewelry. So if you say what the Bible says there is that nobody should use any, nobody, then in the same place too, following your own interpretation, then nobody should wear cloth. Then everybody should come naked. Assuming every, all women here come naked today. Maybe another pastor will come and preach to you. Because I won't come. I won't allow you to get me into trouble. Praise <laughs> God. Did you hear what I'm saying now? But that place is not saying that people should not use jewelry. That place is saying that godly people must give greater attention to the adornment in the spirit. Spiritual beauty must be of primary concern and it must be supreme over physical outward beauty. What is the essence of a woman that is beautiful outside but that is ugly in the spirit? That's what the Bible is saying. And if you understand scripture very well, it's also talking about moderation. Somebody say moderation. Moderation is the key. So, when people talk and say, if you choose to use jewelry, use it with a sense of godly control. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. Now, assuming now, somebody brings one earring that is bigger than his than her head, one here, one here, and is dropping to this place, dropping to this place, and all her nails are just like that of ego or vulture. You know there are nails like that now. Are you hearing me now? And then he appears exactly like Jezebel because you don't. She looks exactly like a ghost. She's yellow, brown, black, blue, reddish, and all that. All kinds of confusion in the name of colors. Are you hearing me now? And she come and say, "I said Jesus as your Lord and Savior." Now she can dress like that. It's her own problem. Are you with me now? Is our own problem. But does he edify? Does he even edify him herself? Not to talk of another person watching. Did you get that now? Praise God. Okay? Paul was talking about, okay, some people were saying that, what about food offered to idol? What about food ordered to offer to idol? Can we eat it as Christians? Can we eat it as Christians? Paul is saying, look, to us as children of God, there are no idols. Abi, there are no idols. We know only one true God. So if you get to any social food and they set a food in front of you, eat it without, without any condemnation. You are, eat it. But if somebody comes to you and says, ah, this one is sacrificed to idols. He said, don't eat it. Not because of you. Because to us, as a child of God, there is nothing like idol. Hello? But because of some other fellows that are there. That's why he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. How will you hear that your pastor is eating food that is sacrificed to idol? Will he edify you? Hello? So I should not use my own freedom to damage your own development. For me, I can eat anything that is nothing like I do. Jesus is Lord. Hello? Praise God. I've seen an evangelist that they got into a place, they wanted to do evangelism and he has some young, young Christians that he is leading out as their leader. So he will coach them in the morning, train them, pray for them, and in the evening he will release them to the village to go and talk to people and evangelize. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. And in that village they have, in fact, vulture are just walking. You say, 
Virtue is everywhere. Virtue is everywhere. Virtue is everywhere. Virtue is everywhere. And you know when they say virtue, they say people should not eat virtue. How many of you understand that? That anybody that eats virtue is going to have goita. How many of you have heard that? Hello? Praise God. And so when he, when he ministered to these young Christians and sent them out to go and preach, he was thinking of what would they eat when they come back? They have some food. What, what, what meat would they? Then he just, the vultures are many. And one just throw down to where they are staying. Just catch that one. Kill it. Cut away the head. Cut away the leg. Prepare it very well. And prepare, and that man can cook. And prepare good meal. And when they came back, he blessed the food and gave them. everybody was eating, you know. You no, know, they said, ah, this chicken is very wonderful. Ah. <laughs> he didn't tell them that it's virtual they are eating. Praise God. And the first day was looking for them to have goita. No goita. Sec no goita. No goita. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. <laughs> but <laughs> what if he told them that look, this food though, is is virtual? Would they eat it? <laughs> Praise God. Years ago, my dad came from Lagos. There is a particular cat that we have. That cat has become that cat has become vagabond. It's a male cat, very big as at that time. The cat that we are rearing our, on our own because we have too many uh, rats. Then, when you are sleeping, the rat will not allow you to sleep. They will run through the ceiling. Won't sleep. When you wake up, you won't sleep again. So, we now bought a cat. Rear it. After some years, the cat has become a vagabond. You know when a cat has become a vagabond? Very tough. And it's causing problems. So, when my dad returned from Lagos, he said, Let's kill this cat. And then we put the cat in the sack and then hold it like this and fling it like this and hit it on the floor about three times. He died. When he died, we cut away the head, cut away all the leg, prepare nice food, remove all the liver and all that. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Praise God. <laughs> nice food. We know his cat. So as we were eating it, one woman came. He heard that my dad came from Lagos. So he came to greet us. And he said, ah, that, this is bush meat. <laughs> and daddy said, eat some, eat some, eat some. And then she collected it. And she said, ah, very good. Ah. <laughs> and then when she left, we were laughing that, ah, that woman, if anybody talked to her and said, you have eaten cat, you know, he said, eh, what is cat? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. When they told you this is for idol, for you as a believer, idol, there is nothing like idol. Are you hearing me now? When we used to go and pray on the mountain, only God knows how many candles that some of these white garment churches use for sacrifice. That when, we, when, when I was younger, we were more, we were more rascally. <laughs> We go and pray on the mountain and when we are coming back, you will see all these Kerubu, Seraphim and all that use different kinds of candles. Some of them they've said that leave it there to burn exhaust on the mountain. You know what we do? We pack everything and bring it to church because we are going to do all night that night. So we need, we need, we need candles. Hello? And uh, it was one very rascally evangelist that was training us that time. He would say, hey, yomo, hey, didn't tell him, he would pack all the candles. <laughs> and <laughs> the people that put the candle there as a sacrifice, when they come, they will be happy that God has taken their sacrifice. <laughs> we'll pack everything, come to church. Because, well, we want to, because we do all night, every day that time. I want to do all night. We, have, we need candles. So we see that as divine provision. How can we be using money to buy candles when some foolish people are putting candles on the mountain? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> it, was, it was that, that evangelist that told us that all the sacrifices they play, somebody put yam, uncooked yam 
he put it on the junction. He went, he will carry it. He will, go, he will bless it in Jesus' name and go and eat it. <laughs> and nothing happened to him. He said that one has too much food in his house. That's why he decided to throw some away in the junction. <laughs> so, so he go collect and go and eat it. And nothing happened to him. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. But when, when in the middle of a party, somebody say, this one is to idol. To you, there is nothing like idol. But you will not use your own freedom to damage the development of another person. Are you hearing me now? So you must know the difference between what is lawful and good and what is what can edify. Did you get that? Amen. Number seven. Practical implication of living under godly control means deliberating deliberately allowing your life and conduct to be fully regulated by the word of God. Deliberately allowing your life and conduct to be fully regulated by the word of God. By the word of God. You must come to that level that you deliberately allow your life and conduct to be fully regulated by the word of God. By the word of God. Not by the laws of men. Not by the traditions of men. But by the word of God. Your life and conduct is fully regulated by the word of God. It is the word of God that is determining what you can do and what you cannot do. Not even what you want to do on your own. But what the word of God says. That is what it means to be living under godly control. And number eight. Because I want to go to responsibility and accountability. Number eight, experiencing freedom from human ungodly control and satanic manipulation. Experiencing freedom from human ungodly control and satanic manipulation. Once you come under godly control, you are going to experience freedom from human ungodly control and satanic manipulation. Did you get that now? Praise God. Experiencing human, experiencing freedom from human ungodly control and satanic manipulation. That is number eight practical implication of living your life under godly control. How many of you agree with me that once you are living your life under godly control, then human being cannot control you again? Yes or no? And then the devil cannot manipulate you again. So once you have chosen to live your life under godly control, the next thing that will happen is that you will experience freedom from human ungodly control and satanic manipulation. Is that okay? Praise God. So that is the practical. Now, when, when you get home, I want you to study and meditate on the practical implication of living your life under godly control. Godly control is number one spiritual force that an authority figure will bring into your life. And when you begin to live under godly control, you are in a position in the spirit to make qualitative decisions of destiny. Is that okay? Because your life is regulated by the word of God. Is that okay? Number two, you know there are three forces we spoke about. Yes or no? The second force is responsibility. Can you imagine a life without godly control? Huh? Will that give a future? So that's why you need an authority figure. Because the first thing an authority figure brings into your life is godly control. Is that okay? So the second one is responsibility. In front of responsibility, I want you to write responsibility. Call, just write number two, responsibility. And in front of it, write responsibility. Actually, what they call responsibility is responsibility. Are you hearing me now? That what you are supposed to do, what you are supposed to respond to, you have the ability to respond to it as at where you should respond. 
That is what they call responsibility. When they say that man is not responsible, that woman is not responsible, it simply means that our responsibility is either low or not in existence. Hello, somebody. Somebody say responsibility. Say responsibility. So what they call responsibility is actually responsibility. There are things you should respond to. There are things you should do. There are, so when, when your responsibility is either very low or not even there, they say that man is not responsible. That woman is not responsible. And the second critical force of the spirit that an authority figure brings into your life is the force of responsibility. It doesn't matter your age. Once you submit properly to an authority figure and he knows what he should do in your life, as a godly and anointed authority figure, he brings the force of responsibility into your life. Did you get that? Praise God. The presence and godly influence of righteous authority figure compel you to become responsible at all times. The presence and godly influence of righteous authority figure compel you to become responsible at all times. Okay? When you are following a godly authority figure, his presence and influence and righteous godly influence over your life makes you to become responsible at all times. At all times. At all times. That's why you need an authority figure in your life. And once you are responsible at all times, you are in a state of mind and a state of life that you will be fit to make qualitative decisions of destiny. Irresponsible people can make qualitative decisions. They will also make irresponsible decisions. Is that okay? Praise God. So the presence and influence of righteous authority if you got compel you to become responsible at all times. So again, let me break it down to what you can handle and what everybody can practice. Write this down. Practical implications of living a responsible life. When you say somebody is living a responsible life, how many of us want to live a responsible life? How many of us want to live a responsible life? You want to be responsible. I'll tell you some practical implications of living a responsible life. What are the things you watch out for? How will you live? That they will say this man is responsible under God. This woman is responsible. Do you know many Christians are not responsible? Right? There are people that go to church, but they are not responsible. Do you know it's possible for a pastor not to be responsible? We have irresponsible pastors. We have irresponsible workers. Do you know we have irresponsible government? So because somebody is, says he's a Christian and he goes to church, doesn't mean he's automatically responsible. No. We live in a world that too many people are irresponsible. We have irresponsible young men, irresponsible old people. I have seen irresponsible grandpa. So what is the practical implication of living a responsible life? Number one, if you're going to have a future, you must choose to live a life that is responsible. And that is one of the force that an authority figure brings into your life. And that's why you need an authority figure. Number one, living your life at all times with a sense of duty. With a sense of duty. 
What is my duty? What is my duty? What is my duty? In the house you are living, what is my duty? Some of you, some of you teenagers, you live in the house, you still expect your mother to come and tell you how to sweep the floor, to wash the plate, to clean the kitchen. You are becoming irresponsible. An irresponsible teenager become irresponsible adult. As a young man, as a young woman, as a boy, as a girl, when you stay with your mother or with anybody older than you, you don't need to be told that you are the one that should clean the floor and do things in the house. Did you hear that? Or would you expect your father or mother to come and cook for you? Or to come and clean the floor for you? Hello? How many of you are hearing what I'm saying now? It is the spirit of irresponsibility for a boy or a girl to be in his parent's house and still be waiting to be told to go and sweep the floor, to go and wash the dishes, to go and it is the spirit of irresponsibility. Assuming you don't know anything, once you were told once, you don't wait again to be told again. And if you wait to be told again and again and again, you are simply becoming irresponsible. And your future is compromised. Because the same spirit of irresponsibility is what you are going to take to the future. Nobody will call you to come and eat. But they will have to call you to wash plates. That's irresponsibility. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. When you are sick and, 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 and the pastor either come to your house to pray for you or send some people to come and pray for you, don't you like it? Answer me, don't you like it? So after the service, when some other people didn't come and, they now, and the pastor now says, everyone workers should stay now and say, you, 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 go to so and so, go, go, go to so and so. And they say, ah, how can this, that? You are becoming irresponsible. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Hello. Did you hear that? We are living in a world today that is talking about human rights, human rights, human rights, human rights, human rights. Small time. All of them will gather together. They say they are human rights activists, human rights activists, human rights activists, human rights activists. But nobody has ever gathered as human responsibility activists. Have you ever heard that before? Answer me now. Have you ever heard that before? They say, okay, we are human responsibility activists. How many of you have heard of that? Human responsibility. Listen to me. Before you begin to talk about rights, you must fulfill responsibility. Otherwise, you qualify for rights. If I preach to you and I do my duty as a pastor, in the church and the church need something and we say okay but the church need a gadget or what we want to do something and it's going to cost us 200,000 naira and I say all members of the church will come together all men do this all women do this all that do this. that's a family obligation it's a responsibility it doesn't have to be convenient for everybody hello hello as long as you are a member of that church, it's your responsibility. So if you are failing in responsibility, you shouldn't be looking for right. But we live in a world today that nobody wants to talk about right. Most people are so irresponsible. All they want is right, right. Husband is talking about my right as the husband, but he's not talking about his responsibility. He's talking to the world after all. I am the head of... If any man has to tell his wife that he's the head of the family, he has lost headship. We know head by their responsibility. Women talk about my right, my right, my right, my right. What about your responsibility to your husband? Have you done it? You have no right to demand for your right until you have fulfilled your what? Responsibility. Tell somebody, pay your due. Say it again, pay your due. Say it again, pay your due. Say it again, pay your due. We have pastors today who don't teach about the responsibility of members. 
But we have members who are very fast to demand for their rights. But they don't know their responsibility. And some that know their responsibility don't want to do their responsibility. Citizens has responsibility. Citizens of a country has no right to talk about their rights without fulfilling their what? Responsibility. Did you hear that, beloved? So, because nobody is talking about responsibility and all that, a lot of people have become irresponsible. Our right. Our right. Our right. What about responsibility? Anywhere you find yourself, always ask yourself, what is my responsibility in this place? As a daughter in the house, what is your responsibility? What's your responsibility? Okay? As a son in the house, what is your responsibility? As a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a wife, as a pastor, everybody, in any way you find yourself, what are my responsibilities? And fulfill your responsibilities. So an authority figure, if you are going somewhere in the future and you are going to fulfill destiny, you must become responsible. Is somebody hearing me now? Irresponsible people have no place in the future. In fact, when the glorious future show up, they will be unfit to manifest. So the second force that an authority figure brings into your life is the force of responsibility. And most people don't like that. They don't like to be responsible. But an authority figure brings that force into your life. Because it is part of what you need. To, make, to be able to make a qualitative decision. <clears throat> so living your life at all times with a what? A sense of duty. Let's complete that statement. That is knowing what you should do. That is knowing what you should do. Okay? Knowing what you should do and what you are expected to do. You know, that is what you should do. That is what you are expected to do. You must know the two. Knowing what you should do and what you are expected to do and deliberately doing them without being told or coerced. I want everybody to think about that very well. You will know either you are responsible or you are not responsible. But if you have not been responsible, you can become responsible from today. That is, knowing what you should do and what you are expected to do and deliberately doing them without being told or coerced. Is that okay? That is what is called responsibility. A lot of people know what they should do. But they won't do it. A lot, of the, a lot of people are waiting to be told. Before they do what they should do. If you are always waiting for somebody to tell you to do what you should do. You are irresponsible. And every one of us that has a future must deal with that spirit. That spirit is a bad spirit. It can take anybody down. Did you hear what I'm saying now? You must know what to, In fact, assuming you don't even know at all, they should not tell you more than once. Did you hear? They should not tell you more than once. And once you are told, this is what you should do. Next thing is that keep doing it without being told or coerced. You don't need anybody to intimidate you before you do what you should do. If you don't do your work in this house, I won't give you food. If, you are, if, if that is what you respond to, you are not getting set for your future. So you now go and do it now because they are threatening that they will not give you food. It, told, it tells me that you love food more than your future. And that you can die because of food. A normal human being that is going to the future to happen even if they have to tell you what you should do once, 
you should now not, not wait until you are told again. That is the spirit of responsibility. You keep doing what you should do without being told and without being coerced. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying now? How many of you heard me? Say, I hear you, sir. Good, because I really want you to hear it. Because the spirit of irresponsibility is the spirit that reduces your future manifestation. That's why many, 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 many children, many, many, many daughters today, that the things they should learn from their mother, while they are still under their mother, they fail to learn it because of the spirit of irresponsibility, and it broke their home in the future. That's why there are some boys, what they should learn from their mother and learn from their father, because of the spirit of irresponsibility, they didn't learn it. They became a beast of a husband in the future. And they become an irresponsible father in the future. When I look at people that are irresponsible, it is not today, it starts somewhere, yesterday. Most of the young boys that are becoming irresponsible are unfortunately going to be the husband of somebody tomorrow. And unfortunately going to be the father of somebody tomorrow. I pity those people that he will become their father and that, that woman, that, that, that kind of a boy will become the husband. Are you hearing me now? When we, fi when, when, when we, finish, when, when we finish all night early this morning with the, men, with the men, I was talking to my associates in the office and I said, and I mentioned some ladies that have pastored years ago and I said, if I hear that they get married today, I will congratulate the husband for being for, for bad luck. Because those ladies are bad luck waiting to happen somewhere. Somebody that has no respect for his father, for her father, has no respect for pastor, has no respect for any authority, that's a disaster in the life of any man. The same thing goes to young men. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. And there are some parents that have passed out before that they themselves have no training. So they have nothing to offer their children. The truth of the matter is that you can't give what you don't have. I've passed out some naughty parents before that have no home training themselves. This is my 25 years of pastoring. I've passed out some parents that I have to be teaching the man how to button up. And he's even resisting it. Hello? When a grandpa is dressing like a garage boy. And I have to tell him, uh -uh, Sir, uh -uh, why are you doing this? Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, and he's still resisting it. Then you can pity what training is going to give his children. Are you hearing me now? Praise God. People are looking for nice pastors. They are not looking for strong pastors. You must be looking for a strong pastor. That is when your future is safe. I told one woman, I said, look, I am not the pastor you want. I am the pastor you need. And I'm never going to be the pastor you want. I will always be the pastor you need. Don't look for the pastor you want to. Look for the pastor you need. I hope somebody understands that. When you want your children to be materially relevant to you, but you want them to be eternally useless to themselves, lower the standard for them. Did you hear what I just said? If you want your children to be materially relevant to you and be eternally useless for themselves, then lower the standard for them. How many of you know that it is easier for a stack illiterate to raise a son to become professor than for a professor to raise another to raise his own son to become a professor like himself. How many of you know that? That it is easier. A stack illiterate, an illiterate farmer can successfully raise a son to become professor. But a professor father 
we find it more difficult to raise a professor's son. Do you know why? Because when, when a professor father has become a professor and there is money now, the first thing that he will want to do is to prevent his own son from the rigorous discipline that make him become a professor. The discipline that make him become a professor. Did you get what I'm saying now? Are you hearing me now? Praise God. But a farmer that has seen poverty will take his own son through all the rigor of discipline and all that and tell him, look here. You have nothing to inherit to except you will inherit cutlass. If you don't read, that's the end of your life. How many of you understand what I'm saying now? How many of you know that most children that become bullies in the universities are children of great people? Because if, if, they, if they rusticate him in that university, his father will use contact and then they give him he will get admitted to another university. How many of you know that's how they think? But when your father has no contact, <laughs> has nobody, even the admission that you are using in that university is only by the grace of God. <laughs> nobody will tell you to hold it very well. Because you know there is nothing to go home to get. Hello, somebody. Tell somebody, become responsible. Life has no respect for an irresponsible person. I didn't say people. I said life itself has no respect for an irresponsible. Number two, practical implication of living a responsible life. Deciding never to shack your responsibility or avoid your legitimate roles. Deciding never to shack. Once I know this is my responsibility, I'm not going to shack it and I'm not going to avoid my legitimate roles. Take that decision. That is how to practically live a responsible life. Deciding never to shack your responsibility or avoid your legitimate roles. When you are sent to school, what is your major responsibility in that school? To read, study hard, and pass. Not to go and do Miss Unica or Mr. Universe. Are you with me now? Praise God. As a father, paying the school fees of my children is my legitimate roles and my responsibility. And it doesn't matter how I'm never going to look away from it. I'm never going to be alive except for when they have scholarship and allow other people to be doing my responsibility. When you are alive and somebody is doing your responsibility, you are as good as what? Dead. Officially, you are dead. Hello? So how I pay the school fees is not the business of anybody. If I like, I sell my clothes if it concerns that, whatever. But I will not have my head standing on my neck when I fail to do my responsibility. It destroys my pride as a father. Is somebody hearing me now? I've seen fathers today that when the children are, when it is time for the children to really need money and all that, the man will run away from the house. You will elope with one useless woman. So it's only the woman that will be suffering and suffering and suffering and raising the children and all that and all that. Are you hearing me now? And when the children have now settled down in life and everything is fine now, the man will be looking for somebody to help him beg. 
And some people will come and be preaching to the woman. Uh, forgive me. Shebi, you don't have another husband. It's better to die than to be a liability. If you die, they will know that you are dead. Rest in peace. Your chapter is closed. So nobody is going to, but you are alive and you are. That's official death. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying now? Did you hear what I'm saying now? So you must know what is my responsibility. Somebody say my responsibility. When I know my responsibility and my legitimate roles, I won't turn away from it. Turn away from it. Turn away from it. Doesn't matter that I go to borrow the money, either I go to this, either whatever. When it is time to pay the school fees, it is my responsibility to say, this is your school fees. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And anybody that's going to have a future, must have, the same thing when you are working in your, in your place of work, it, anywhere, once you know your responsibility, don't ever shack it. If you are a civil servant and you are always collecting query for dereliction of duty, you don't have a future in that civil service. Are you here? You are a civil servant, you are a teacher, every time they give you query, the reliction of duty. How many of you have heard that statement before? It's an official query language. <laughs> the reliction of duty. The reliction of duty. Every time, every time. You don't have a future in that. God is not going to help you there. You must do your work. Tell somebody, do your work. Why are you not talking to me? I said, do your work. In church, do your work. Do your work. Everybody has your own responsibility. Do your own. Don't worry. So and so are not doing their own. So I'm not going to do it. You are copying failure. Uh, the video also doesn't do so. So I will also behave like that. That's copying failure. Be a model of success. Is somebody hearing me now? If the whole world fail in their responsibility, don't fail in yours. Do your own. That is how to become responsible. Number three. Never looking for free things or desiring ungodly bailout. That's how to be practically responsible. Never looking for free things or desiring ungodly bailout. Never looking for free things. Or designing ungodly bailout, ungodly bailout, ungodly bailout, ungodly bailout. Did you get what I'm saying now? We are people that are looking for free things, free things, free things, free things, free things, free things. Free things. And that tendency has come to church. Free food, free transportation, free accommodation. Ah, everybody will come to that program. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hello, listen to me. I'm never going to do any program like that in my life. We used to do it before. But I've come to a state that I discovered that everything free will raise the spirit of irresponsibility. I'm never going to do it. Free food, free accommodation, free, free, free lunch, free so that you are, can hear the gospel. No, I'm not going to do that. Praise God. I'm not going to give you free transport to come to church. I can give you free transport to go back home after service. Are you with me now? After service. We can give you free transport to go, but not to give you free transport to come. Do you, how many of you know that churches in Lagos, that they have free lunch on Sunday? So all the area boys in town will be coming to that church. Not because they are born again, no. But because of the free rice they will eat. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? We may subsidize the price, but you are not going to have it free. That mentality free, 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 Don't look for free things. Are you hearing me now? 
And don't be looking for godly bailout. Don't be looking for godly bailout. Don't, don't, don't develop your life that. Don't develop your life that. There are times that people will pay price for you. But it's a, going to be a temporary season in your life. Hello, somebody. Hello. It's going to be a temporary war season. Maybe as you are starting out life, some people pay price for you. But that's not going to be your permanent position if you are going to be responsible. Okay, after some time, season will change that you just have to pay your own way to. And rather become a blessing to other people that are also coming up. Not that you will now be a permanent liability for somebody. You are now looking for free team, free team, free team, free team, free team. Are you hearing me now? Have you seen women that have five children? And they now parade out the five children and they are now begging in the market. I asked myself, where is the father of those five children? Because you discover that most of the time the father is not dead. If the father is dead, we understand that. But even the father is dead, you don't need to parade the five children as item in the market and be begging and evoking and living on people's sympathy. It's a useless way to live. When people have to sympathize with you, to give you, it's a useless way to live. You will not amount to anything. You're, you will have identity crisis. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. One of my members sometimes came to me some years back and she told me that one woman used to come to the house every Saturday and always come to beg for food, beg for things, beg for that. And so when she told me, and she said, I, I, I give her, I just give her things. I said, you are not helping that woman because she's going to perpetually depend upon you. You are not helping her. He said, what will I do, sir? I said, the next time you come on Saturday, tell him that he will be washing your clothes from now on. So that if it is money you give her and food you give her, she will have a sense of eating from her labor. Hello? Did you hear what I say now? So come to the house. You clean the house every week. Since she comes every week to come and beg. This time around I say, tell her to come every week. She will clean the house, wash the clothes, and then you will pay her. If you want to give her money, you give her money. If you want to give her food, whatever you want to give her. I don't mind whatever you choose to give her. Even if you like, give her 10 million naira. It doesn't mean anything. But it will be that she has done something. Hello, somebody. And then the woman took that wisdom. So, the next week, when the woman showed up in her house, she said, hey, madam, uh, from now on, I have a job for you. You will be buying, you will be washing this cloth and doing these things, probably sweeping the house, then I'll give you. You know what the woman did? The woman did not come back again. We have too many stupid people in town that are looking for freebies. So the moment you offer them work, they will tell you that eh, eh, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. If not, if not for what happened, let him die of hunger. He's a lazy, he's a lazy lout. Don't let anybody manipulate your emotion. If you didn't work, you won't have money to give to somebody. Did you hear that? You must know the difference between emotion, pity, and foolishness. A, a wise person will embrace that offer. Yes or no? And say, ah, thank you, man. I will be ready to do anything for you. Praise God. That's how you know good people. Amen. Never looking for free, be, free things or designing, or designing ungodly bailout. Number four, willingness to pay the legitimate price. That's number, number four now. Willingness to pay the legitimate price of whatever you are looking for. Willingness to pay the legitimate price of whatever you are looking for. Willingness to pay the legitimate price of whatever you are looking for. I have to run now. My time is gone now. 
willingness to pay the legitimate price of whatever you are looking for. God can give you free of charge, but you must be willing to pay what? The legitimate price of whatever you are looking for. Constant readiness to go the full length without cutting corners. Constant readiness to go the full length without cutting corners or engaging in sharp and illegal practices. Constant readiness to go the full length without cutting corners or engaging in sharp and illegal practices. Do you know we have people today that are engaging in sharp practices in illegal practices? They don't want to go through the full length. That is irresponsibility. A responsible person wants to go through the full length. I want every student here, secondary school student, raise up your hand. Secondary school student, you are here. How many of you like to have A1? Nine A1 in Waek. Nine A1 in Waek. How many of you? How many of you want to have nine F9 in Waek? How many of you want to have nine A1 in Waek? Eh? Good. Raise up your hand. Raise it very well. Don't put it down until I ask you to put it down. Now, I'm using them to teach this truth. Listen to me. What you should be finding out is what, what will I be doing from now that will make me to legitimate thing that I must be doing now that will make me to have 9A1. Did you hear me now? Hello? Did you hear me now? For those of you who are, who are ladies, the legitimate things to be doing now that will give you 9A1 is not fashion. It's not what? It's not fashion. If you allow fashion to take you away now, you'll be distracted. If you allow boyfriend to take you away, you'll be distracted. So, having 9A1 is not just a function of prayer. And those of you who are boys, staying in class is part of what would make you have A1 now. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Praise God. So, you must know what should I be doing now. People love good things, but they don't like to pay good price for good thing. You can't have good thing free of charge. Hello? Did you get what I'm saying now? That's why you see all this uh, miracle center is increasing. Because we have an irresponsible society that want to give glory to a lazy person. And when some people are praying, they say God should give glory to a lazy person. I say God is not foolish like you are. God doesn't give glory to a lazy person. Because he himself is a hard-working God. How many of you are hearing me? Put down your hand. You want 9A1? It is possible. It is achievable. You must be ready to pay the price. Somebody say, pay the price. Go through the full length. No sharp corner. No sharp practices. No illegal practices. Are you hearing me now? Mr. Lade, you are a teacher. You know that the educational, somebody told me yesterday, they said the educational standard is lowered. I said, look, lowered is a good language. We have no standard again. When they are doing promotion, criteria for promotion from SS2 to SS3, a class that is going to face work and a school is using two pass and one credit, that's a hopeless situation. And even at that, how many students are meeting up? Because all they are thinking is that the school will organize or do for them. And that is what schools do now. The, the, the parents won't bring their children to school where the principal is not going to support such organization. So they, will, they are ready to pay the, they are ready to pay examination and practice as part of statutory fee for the final year student. Are you hearing me now? They will do PTA meeting and the principal will tell them, look, this is the money we will use to help your children. This is the money we will use to take care of their examiners. This is the money we will use to take care of the ministry official. We, are, we, are, we have an armed robbery as a generation. And that's why we have irresponsible children who don't know do, 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 how many of you know what, what the general of NYC said last week? 
the new director N NYC DG. He said that he has graduates that are mobilized to go to camp that cannot write simple statements in English. How did we get there? I know a teacher who teaches English language in secondary school and teaches certificate class who cannot make a single correct statement on Facebook. I know one. Hello? That every of his Facebook posts are uh, his headache, grammatically. And I asked my wife, I said, what is this teaching? He said, it's English language. Certificate, ah, uh, I say, uh, uh, the future of those children is horrible. It's horrible. Because you can't give what you don't have. Praise God. Must everybody teach? Hello, somebody. Nigeria know the truth, but who is going to say the truth now? That is what is killing our nation. And when you say no way, we're not going, they say you don't want them to help the children. In my own days, helping means the teacher will do a good job of preparing. Yes or no? And listen to me. Any one of you who is a teacher and you are under my calling and you are involved in examination matrices, my anointing will bring you down. Did you hear that? If you like, say amen. If you like, don't say amen. The anointing of my life will bring you down, will bring your children down. Except God didn't call me. So if you are going to be a teacher to Mama Wan, you know, examination, my better watch out. You mean lottery or they share it. Because once you cooperate to spoil the life of other children, your, your, your children as you have mortgaged their future. Did you hear that? I can't be sweating here and preaching good message to you and all that and you go out there and be doing nonsense. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. Praise God. So do your best. Anywhere you are, do your best. Anywhere you are, do your best. I told people when they, are, when they, are, when they want to do election, they go and collect money. A politician that, that wants that say he wants to come and say, we give her five thousand, give her five thousand, we give her five thousand. Are you hearing me now? The one that happened last, I understood that. But let me tell you, I have said it over and over again. Election is coming again. If you are a member of this church and you stay under my calling and you collect five thousand to vote for the four years, you will be in poverty. Not even when I pray for you, God is not going to answer you. Did you hear that? How much is five thousand? Talk back. Go to the book. On jail, do my own lobby. On one say more any college. Even when I pray, it's not going to happen. Because until we begin to have serious, some one, one, somebody went to a pastor, and he said, "Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. I don't want to commit adultery again. I don't know what is making me commit it and all." I said, "No problem. I've been praying for you over the years. Yet you fall into this sin. Okay, no problem." Kneel down now. Say after me. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. The next adultery I commit, let it be my death sentence. He said, eh? He said, Pastor, are you cursing me? Then the pastor said, are you planning to con commit another adultery? So you see, people are not ready to change. One can watch church. You are not ready to change. Christian is not ready to change Nigeria. I want a problem in Nigeria. If when you see a serious Muslim, they take their thing very serious. Are you hearing me now? But how many Christians are serious with, with righteousness? Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. Oh, I know the house is very cold. Oh, yes. But I have no apology for everything I've said because it is the truth. Number five, write this. Not looking for undeserved favors. Not looking for undeserved favor. That is how to be responsible. When you are looking for a favor you deserve, that's okay. Not looking for undeserved favor. And always rejecting the moral option of a quick fix and irresponsible waivers. Not looking for undeserved favor.
when I see a good result, I can monitor it to any length to get admission. But when the result is not good, I tell the person, look, I can't, I can't put my name on the line for this bad result. So it's better for the boy or the girl to do it again. He say, I use your connection. I don't use my connection for righteous purpose. Simple. I tell my children, when they want to go for any exam, I'm not going to beg for you. You better be qualified. If you are not qualified, I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to go into any office and allow one person to look at me as a foolish person. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. I won't do that. But when a result is good, I can go to anywhere, present it in front of anybody and say, check out this result. It's good. This boy needs this admission. Are you hearing me now? But I'm not going to beg for a result that is shameful and say I use my connection. No, I have my connection to use for righteous purposes, not for wrong things. I'm not going to do that. Are you hearing me now? I tell my children, you better do well. I'm not going to beg for you. I can't beg for you. I can't beg for Mark. I can't beg for anything. Better do well. Because I won't do something that somebody will say, eh, but he called himself a pastor. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. Not looking for undeserved favor. And always rejecting the immoral option of a quick fix. And irresponsible waivers. People that are not responsible will want you to waive things for them. How many of you know that are crash that are Bible school today that are on crash program? And at the end of the program, they ordain them as pastors. You will you ever have a medical school that run crash program? Eh? And give them license to do surgery. And you will take your own wife or daughter or whatever to, to carry yourself to that kind of person. He will butcher you. <laughs> and separate your kidney from your lung. <laughs> Before you know what is happening, you are already on the portals of glory. Praise God. <laughs> ah, number six. Are we still together? No, don't worry, I'll release you now. Constantly maintaining the discipline of reliability. You must be reliable. When you are not reliable, you are not responsible. You must be reliable. Somebody say, constantly maintain the discipline of reliability. You must be a person that when they give you an assignment, the person that gave you the assignment can go to sleep. Because you are reliable. You will get the job done. Not that they will give you assignment and the person that gives you assignment will not be able to sleep. Are you hearing me now? Constantly maintaining the discipline of reliability, trustworthiness, excellence, and hard work. That is how to become responsible. Constantly maintaining the discipline of reliability, trustworthiness, excellence, and hard work. Everywhere I go to preach, they always desire that I come back again. Not just the second time, but the third, the fourth time, and as many times as possible. Are you hearing me now? Because I won't accept any invitation that I cannot give my best to. You must be a person that you are, they say, is reliable. Let it be said about you that that man is reliable. That woman is reliable. That is when you have a future. Hello, somebody. Are you hearing me now? Those of you that are artisans here, don't use the money of somebody's job to do another person's job. And you are now posting this other person, posting this other person, posting this other person. Are you hearing me now? Don't be a tailor that when they give you cloth in January, by December, that person will not be able to use it to do Christmas. That's a hopeless tailor. Don't be like that. They will give you a bad reputation for yourself. Are you hearing me now? Did you hear what I'm saying now? Because most of the artisans, they say, God, God, give me breakthrough. You must know how to become responsible. Don't allow people to 
Don't, 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 don't tell people that God come and collect your job next week when you are sure that next week it won't be ready. Develop a standard that when you say today is 27th, am I correct? Okay, this cloth won't be ready until 27th of August. Ah, he said, please now let it be ready by two weeks. Ah, no, it cannot be ready. It's August. Are you hearing me now? And he said, okay, no problem. Make sure that Three days or a week before that day, the cloth is what? Is ready. So when it shows up, you deliver. Tell somebody, deliver. Say, deliver. Say, deliver. Are you hearing me now? Uh -huh. that's, that's, that's reliability. That's how to be responsible. Constantly maintaining the discipline of reliability, trustworthiness, excellence, and hard work. Amen. Now, let me stop here. I'll take accountability, which is the third part, next month. Okay? See that time is really gone. Are you blessed tonight? Is it worth your coming? I want you to rise up on your feet. The, out of the three basic forces that an authority figure brings into your life, we've done two today. The first one is godly control. The second one is what? Responsibility responsibility. Responsibility. I don't want you to pray prayer and say, God, make me responsible. No. I want you to pray and say, Father, I choose as from today to be responsible. Did you get that? And there is a spirit that is going to come upon you from now. It's the spirit of responsibility. Jesus said, I must do the work of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. What do you think that is? That is responsibility. Yes or no? That's responsibility. Assuming Jesus didn't do the work of him that sent him while it is day. Our salvation will not be completed. Today. He was responsible. Your responsibility is going to help somebody else in their own life. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? Praise God. Responsibility. Somebody say responsibility. Responsibility. So we're going to put those two forces into our life. When you get home, I want you to study your notes very well and then pray very well. There are too many prayers you can pray, but I believe the Holy Spirit will give those prayers to you as you study on your own. Hello? Did you get that? But I want you to pray one prayer. Number one. Say after me, Father, I bring my life under godly control as from today. I choose to become responsible in all that I do. Open your mouth and begin to pray. Everyone must pray this prayer. I bring my life under godly control. I bind every spirit of foolishness. Every reckless spirit. Every spirit that always wants to do what he likes and not what God likes. Every deception of I can do what I like. I can do anything I like at any time. I bind that spirit, I cast that spirit out. It's a spirit that is against your future. You cannot do anything you like at any time. The Bible said concerning Daniel, Daniel has proposed in his mind that he will not defile himself with the king's portion. That's godly control. So even if the king's portion is there, he decides he's not going to defile himself. Father, I bring my life under the control of the Holy Spirit. Every spirit of negligence, every spirit of carelessness, every spirit of lawlessness, I bind you, I cast you out of my life. Holy Ghost, take over my life. 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 Over my life. Over my life. Not what I want to do, not what is convenient for my flesh, but what you want to do in the name of Jesus. I choose to be responsible 
every spirit of irresponsibility. I bind you, I cast you out of my life. I will never shack my responsibility again. At home, in the office, in church, in my family. Let the grace of responsibility rest upon me. I'm not going to look away from what I should do. I won't wait until I'm told. As from today, I shall do what I should do. Willingly without being told. In the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of corruption. Every spirit that is looking for free things. And every weakness for ungodly bailout. I take authority over it. I will pay my way through. I will pay the price. I will go the full length. In the name of Jesus. I will not be an object of people's pity. I will not be an object of people's emotion. I will pay through my way. And God is going to help me. I'm not going to look for undeserved favor. I'm not going to look for sharp. I'm not going to engage myself in sharp practices. The Bible says righteousness exalted the nation. But sin is a reproach of people. The anointing of responsibility. Let it fall upon men and women here tonight. Online on ground. The anointing of responsibility. Let it come fall upon men and women. In the name of Jesus. God is looking for nation builders. People that will be faithful to build their nation. God is not going to bring other people for, to come and build Nigeria. We are the salt of the earth. We are the blight of the world. We will walk in our duty as salt and light. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name we pray. I want to pray for you. I want you to receive the prayers. If you consider me as a man of God, open your spirit and receive these prayers. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bring everybody under the sound of my voice, online, on ground, that is open to this truth and open to this teaching, that as from today, every spirit of lack of control, I break that yoke. Every deception that I can do what I like, I can say what I like, I am free to do anything I like, even though it is not correct, I take authority over that spirit. I bind that spirit and I cast that spirit out. That from today you will not do what you like. You will do what God likes. In the name of Jesus, I bring everyone under the anointing of divine control. The anointing of divine control. The anointing of divine control. That as from today we will know their safe limit and the righteous limit and boundaries in our life. And we will not go over the boundaries in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of arrogance I take authority over you. I bind you, I cast you out. Holy Ghost take over. 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 As from today, you will carry the anointing that respects structure. You will carry the anointing that respects process. You will carry the anointing of righteous restraint. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of carelessness. I take authority over the spirit of frivolity. I take authority over the spirit of lawlessness. I bind that spirit and I cast it out. That out of the men and women online on ground responding to this truth, you will raise a group, a generation of nation builders. A generation of worthy models. In the name of Jesus. People that will do things thoroughly. The way it should be done. Let that anointing rest upon you. I banish every tendency for foolishness. I banish every tendency for mediocrity. In the life of everyone that is open to this truth. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost take over. Holy Ghost take over. As from you today, with you, not everything goes again. Only the will of God shall be done. No matter the freedom, you will use the freedom to glorify God. 
You will use your freedom for righteous purposes. You will not, that will, will not know, no, none of you will live a life of abuse any longer. In the name of Jesus. Let the anointing for responsibility rest upon you. As from today, you will be a responsible human being, a responsible wife, a responsible husband, a responsible wife, a responsible husband, a responsible mother, a responsible responsible daughters, responsible sons, responsible people, responsible citizen, responsible members. In the name of Jesus, you will never live your life being perpetually an object of people's pity. In the name of Jesus. As from today, no more cutting corners. No more sharp practices. We are a nation of righteousness. Bible says we are peculiar people. We are royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. Let our revelation come from that identity. Let our identity come from that revelation. In the name of Jesus. That everywhere you go, you will be a light. And you will be a salt of the earth. You will be a model of godliness. That it will, it will not be it will not be you that will be collecting money before you vote. It will not be you, you that, will be, that will be bribing your way. You will pay the price. And in paying the price, you will be, begin to develop and become stronger and fit for the future. I pray for you that when the future show up, you will not be a slave. When the future show up, you will not be unfit. When the future show up, you will not be disqualified. Thank you, Father. I pray that the Holy Ghost will process this truth in the spirit of man. This truth in the spirit of man. Every spirit that reject the truth, I bind that spirit and I cast that spirit out. That you will have a deeper revelation of the truth tonight and your life and future will be secured in the glory of God. Thank you, Father. Blessed do Lord be your holy name. We give you praise, we give you glory for this visitation. Thank you for marking us out differently in this generation with the mark of the truth. We will carry it to, to our nations and our lives will never remain the same. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.